from scientists to look at the facts in front of them and evaluate them. Mm. Well, of course, when you've constructed a very elaborate theory and you think you've already explained and you've told the public that you've already explained an important part of science, then naturally you're reluctant to have that overturned, to change it overnight. Scientists have made a big investment of their careers, their futures, I suppose even their pensions in believing certain theories and when somebody comes along and tries to overturn that then not surprisingly they're not very happy. Yes. It seems to be almost commonplace scientists are usually ridiculed when they discover, make new discoveries and this applies to people who we today regard as heroes of science, people like Michael Faraday, Thomas Edison, the Wright brothers, they were all absolutely ridiculed at the time that they made their discoveries. It was only later that they were regarded as heroes. Let me give you a really great example of scientific rejection. It's meteorites. In, in the 18th century, science decreed that meteorites didn't exist. They were completely unreasonable. Anton Lavoisier, who is regarded as the father of modern chemistry, said stones cannot fall from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. And museums all over Europe were compelled to throw away their meteorites as superstitious relics of the past. As a result, you won't find any meteorite in any museum anywhere in the world that's older than about 1800, except one huge one that fell in Germany that was just too big to get rid of. It, it appears that science is such an authority that people are willing to have the evidence of their own eyes and ears overruled if the theory is accepted by enough scientists. One of the fundamental premises of Darwin's theory is that a species can, if it evolves long enough, turn into another species. Now this central idea is contradicted by every single plant and animal breeding experiment of the last 500 years. Every animal and plant breeder knows that there is a limit to the extent to which an animal or a plant can be changed. Ultimately, the line becomes sterile or it simply reverts to the original type from which you've selected. This has even been given a name. Ernst Mayer, professor of zoology at Harvard, called it genetic homeostasis. And that simply means that there is a barrier beyond which evolution cannot pass. I find it extraordinary that the world's biologists continue to believe in the infinite plasticity of individuals when they know perfectly well that experiments show that it simply can't happen. Darwinism says animals can evolve indefinitely. Our experience of the real world is animals and plants have a definite limit beyond which they cannot go. A good question would be, what would it take for me to change my mind to become a Darwinist? Well, the answer is relatively easy. The whole Earth's surface is covered with sedimentary rocks, and in those rocks there are fossils. It ought to be possible to go to those rocks and to find a sequence of fossils, one species turning into another species turning into another species. In fact, it ought to be possible for the kids at the local kindergarten to do this on an afternoon's nature study at the local quarry. But the world's greatest paleontologists, with the, the resources of the world's greatest universities at their disposal, have failed to do this, and they've been looking for more than 100 years. It, it is an extraordinary phenomenon that uh, Darwinism is a theory which is universally accepted. It has no competitor in sight. It, it is taught in every school and university all over the world. And yet, ultimately, it has no foundation of fact or evidence to support it. It is a reasonable theory, but that's all it is, a reasonable theory. It seems to me that we've got to be, we've got to ask a lot more questions. We've got to be willing to be far more open. We've got to look at the facts, look at the anomalies that have been found, evaluate them, and if they tell us that Darwinism is unsupportable, then we've got to look for a new theory. One point I should make is that I'm not a professional scientist. I'm a science writer. But although I'm not a professional scientist, I have spent 20 years looking at the geology and the paleontology of Great Britain, and I've spent thousands of hours walking around the coast of Britain collecting fossils and mineral specimens. And one of the things that that experience has taught me is that you cannot find a succession of fossils which demonstrate evolution. This was the start of my journey, if you like. I wanted to know why couldn't I go out there and find evidence for evolution? Wh what was I missing? Where was it? One of the things that I found uh, in looking around the cliffs of Britain, one mystery that I discovered was why was it that you could find fossil sea urchins in the chalk which were regular fossils, they'd been petrified, turned to stone, but you could also find the same sea urchin which was filled with flint. Flint is supposed to be a hard material, 
How did it get inside? Well, the idea is that at some stage it must have been soft and jelly-like. But how do you square that with taking millions of years for those rocks and those fossils to form? Doesn't that suggest that somehow the flint fossil was formed relatively rapidly? It was questions like this that made me examine a lot more closely the evidence I'd been offered for Darwinism and just accept it. What I found was that there are too many unanswered questions of this sort, too many mysteries, too many anomalies that have been just pushed to one side in the hope that sometime they'll be answered. I've spent 20 years now looking at the geology and the paleontology of Britain. I've collected thousands of fossils. I haven't found the answers that I'm looking for. Well, I've spent most of my life traveling around the world, searching after archaeological mysteries, lost cities, mysteries of the past, and living dinosaurs. So much of the work I do has to do with actual on-the-site investigations, plus a large part is delving into libraries and books and research. And I have a large book collection, so I do a lot of research like that. I like the idea of being an Indiana Jones kind of person, and it's, it's, it's a designation that I enjoy. Like Indiana Jones, I go out with a machete. I go into remote areas, often where people wouldn't normally go, and many archaeologists have never been, living with remote Indians in the jungles of the Amazon, or crossing the Gobi Desert, or going to sunken cities under the ocean. This is the kind of archaeology I enjoy. And I like reading about these things, too. And therefore, I write about them in my books on lost cities and on the videos that we do and, and take readers there. I travel around the world to various sites, many of them remote, others well-known sites, often hacking my way through the jungle with a machete and my guides or scuba diving to a sunken city that's never been discovered before. But otherwise, much of my research is done in libraries with books and researching the subjects that I'm after. My various researches have led me around the world to giant cities in the Kalahari or the jungles of South America, it's diving to sunken cities on remote islands in the Pacific, or even just going to certain Mediterranean islands or remote ruins in the high Himalayas, that kind of thing. And other researchers have led me as far afield as Australia, New Guinea, and even to many libraries around the world, search of rare books and photos that may exist of unusual sites. I've always been interested in mysteries of the past and archaeology, history, also in the natural studies like dinosaurs and cryptozoology. And as a young man, I think uh, cartoon shows like Johnny Quest or reading about books by Ivan T. Sanderson or Colonel Fawcett, even simply National Geographic has got me interested in traveling around the world, going to unusual exotic locations, seeing for myself the many exciting ruins and mm, archaeological spots that exist. And I began at an early age, traveling around the world when I was only 19, starting in Asia, uh, across to India and to Africa and later to South America. I worked for oil companies and I taught English and did odd jobs to earn my way around the world. And eventually I began writing the books that I write, which is my series called the Lost City series. As I began traveling around the world and looking into archaeological sites, I, I began to realize that there was more to the past than I'd been taught in high school and college. And uh, the, the picture of the past that I began to create in my mind was quite a bit different than 
that that was being taught in history books. The more I found out about the unusual mysteries of the past, the more